celebrated filmmaker Ken Loach. Welcome to Stoke on Trent. Thanks very much. Home of Sir Stanley. <laughs> Boy, well, boyhood were, hero. Was, Bath FC, I believe you were. Bath City, yes. Um, we don't. Uh, we don't have anyone to compare to uh, the great Sir Stanley, but uh, Stan Mortensen played for us. No, that joined the war, so that's yeah. another name to conjure with. Yeah. It is. Your involvement in the miners' strike, um, you were there at the time, and very, very vocal, and made a couple of cracking films about the strike. What brings you to Stoke on Trent tonight? Why is it important to, that we remember this 25 years? Well, yes, I mean, I, I was around um, during the strike. Um, I, I, the people, of course, who really uh, know the story are the miners themselves, so I'm always very um, wary of pontificating too much about it because it's the miners themselves who should tell the story. Um, but I'm here to take part in a question time, which has been organised here, which I'm looking forward to, because I think the miners' strike was the most important domestic event since the Second World War. It was a pivotal moment when, when the consciousness of the 1945 generation, where we built things together and we worked as a team, was replaced by the Thatcherite ideology of look after number one and to hell with everyone else. And the minor strike was that pivotal moment. Your films have always been about normal, everyday people and try to show the lives, the difficulties, the hardships that those people have. And uh, the minor strike could, could have had a more cataclysmic effect on the lives of normal men, women and children. Yes, yes. I mean, I think what was done to the miners and their families and the communities was, was wicked, actually. Uh, it was a conscious destruction of men and women and their families and their children's future and their homes. Um, a conscious decision to destroy in the attack on working people and the attack on trade unions. And, and that, was, um, that was clear from the outset, and Arthur Scargill and the Miners' Union knew it, and to their credit they were very principled in their, in their stance. What led them down was that, of course, the other section of the Labour movement, from the trade union leaders, or the wretched Neil Kinnock and Hattersley, just uh, let, them, let them swing in the wind. That was the problem. I mean, you were a Labour Party member for, for many, many years, a socialist, um, mm. up until you left in the, in the mid-90s. Was it the emergence of the likes of Kinnock that, that drove you away from the party? Yes, I mean, I, I kind of held my nose and stayed there when, uh, when they were leading it. Uh, but the, the, the final thing for me was when the guy who collected the subscription said, I'm not going to collect any more subscriptions, all we want is your visa card number. Um, so they didn't want organisation, they didn't want an active political group of people. They just wanted your subs. And at that point, I thought, well, there's no point in being a member. But I think um, I, I never had any illusions about the Labour Party. It was, always, um, it was always a social democratic party with socialists in it. And so it was always going to favour the bosses rather than working men and women. Um, but it was a place you could fight in. You could, you could struggle for ideas in it. But when Kinnock led the paved the way for Blair, that was really the end, really. What about the Labour Party of today um, compared? I mean, if you were disenfranchised in the, in the 90s, you'd have been pulling your hair out today, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, the, history is a continuum, isn't it? I mean, the um, uh, Wilson and Callaghan prepared the way for Thatcher by leaving the country as it was. Uh, Thatcher pulled the party even further to the right. Uh, Kinnock came in and cleansed the party or, of, the, of all its left uh, then because then the party had no left, Blair emerged and Blair and Brown the new, whole new Labour project was to make Britain safe for the big employers, for the big bosses, so it's been a continuing slide in the wrong direction um, and it's ended up with an illegal war um, probably a million killed you know, and that's the end of that new Labour project. 25 years on, and in Stoke-on-Trent, the evidence of the minor strike is still visible. There's families that don't speak to each other, brothers that have, you know, parted, one went back to work, one didn't. Is it important that we hear those true stories tonight and, and we recognise the sacrifice of those men and women? I think it's very important that we hear the stories, the, very important that we hear the stories from the strike I mean, this, the struggle for history is the struggle for politics. 
because understanding what happened in the past is essential to know what's what's um, what is ha what is happening now and how we can resolve things in the future. So the struggle for history is very political, very important, and the the establishment has a vested interest in telling lies about what has happened. We shall hear some tonight, and so hearing the real stories is what's true. Hearing the real stories of how the police became a national police service overnight and how they would just march through people's houses, beat people in the street, how they would uh, wave five pound notes at the pickets showing the money they were making from the overtime, how the, the BBC and the press and ITV only told one side of the story, how they reversed footage, you know, showing the police charging and then the miners, uh, they showed the miners throwing stones and then the police charging. Actually what happened was the police charged and then the miners threw stones. They just reversed it. It's important we hear all these stories again because no one else is telling them. You, you, st you told those stories in the day with, with your documentary Which Side Are You On? And, and you were a little bit aggrieved, I say, as I say, to, that it wasn't put out at the right time. It came out towards the end of the miners' strike. Mm. How did you feel about that at the time? Well, yes, w what happened was this. I, I was asked to do a programme by the uh, South Bank show, by Melvin Bragg, to do a programme about the miners' strike. And we made one, and it being the South Bank show, we made it about the songs and the poems and the creative writing and the cultural explosion that happened, because that was one of the byproducts of the strike. And um, um, so we made it, and uh, of course we showed what they were writing about, which included the police beating people up. And when Melvin Bragg and Nick Elliott, the head of Melvin Bragg's boss at LWT, saw it, they said, we're not showing this. I said, why not? He said, well, we're not going to show the police doing that. I said, if that were in Latin America, you couldn't wait to get on. But no, they won't show that there. So, so they refused to show it. Um, it went to a documentary festival in Italy and won a prize. And then eventually Melvin Bragg negotiated with Channel 4 that it should be shown, but way in 1985 when they expected the strike to be over. So it was shown, say, a long, much later, and uh, they had a, a, a journalist called, or he'd been a strike leader in his own time, called Jimmy Reed, um, AU, who be, led a strike and then became very right-wing and wrote for the Sun of the Express in Scotland. And he's, he was given uh, half an hour airtime to attack Arthur Scargill without any comeback. And that was the price for them showing this South Bank show. Unimaginable. And they talk. They say there's no political censorship here. There's absolutely political censorship here. Well, I hope you enjoy the debate tonight, and I hope it really manages to tell the, the, the real stories out there. And you know, I hope you really do enjoy it. And thanks for joining us. Okay. Well, of course, it's down to you to tell the stories as well. I mean, you've got access to a medium, and so get the stories out there for people to to hear, because we really need to hear them.